You know, I'm almost running out of stupid jokes to make at the beginning of these weekly videos because it's not funny anymore, I guess. But I also guess when you're in, in cyclical commodities and physical assets for which there is undeniable future demand and on which there are supply issues across the board, you know, think of assets like uh, copper, silver, gold, uranium, especially uranium, by the way, then such moments, the moments in, in, in which it's the hardest to hold on is the exact time in which holding on is the most important, or so I'm told. I'm yet to experience this myself, and so far it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been great. You know, It hasn't been easy because it was, it was painful watching my portfolio go from in profit to in the red and then to double digits and then double, double the double red digit, which it meant that it was down 20%. That was painful, right? Now my portfolio is down 40%. So I've seen it double the double of what was already quite worrying and painful to me. So I'm holding on. I've chosen to apply this contrarian strategy and figure out if it's any good or not while I'm relatively young, although I wish I was doing this when I was 16 so that I know whether to buy heavily or short heavily right now. But hey, you know, in 10 years, if I'm still around, I, I guess I'll know what to do. Maybe, maybe I'll know what to say in the camera too. But yeah, for now... I'm employing the contrarian strategy. And so I'm looking for dead sentiment and I'm trying to go against it. When I see that most people are bearish, I'm trying to buy and vice versa. And well, that's exactly what I'm seeing in gold and silver right now, by the way, uh, because although gold managed to close the week above 1800 last week, it was down just about a percent. Uh, silver didn't manage to hold the ab above $20 line and closed the week down 7%. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very aggressive move for uh, physical metal. Um, Although it is happening a low volume and the relative strength index is suggesting that there is almost no strength left in silver sentiment. And if we had another week like, like um, the one that we just had, if we, ha if we have this same week down 7% next week, the RSI will probably take on to oversold territories. Uh, same goes for the silver equities as measured by the ETFs. Both the SIL and the SILJ were down last week. That's respectively 6 and 7%. And both of them are very close to being oversold as well, or at least that's what my notes say. Uh, you know, you give it a few more weeks of this type of price action and we won't be too far off from the levels of the bottom in 2015, which everybody references as that best buying opportunity of the century, right? Yet now when we're about, um, let's call it a 30 or 40% higher, everybody's scared. Nobody's talking about it. And maybe, by the way, for all I know, rightfully so, you know, the future is as unclear as it's ever been. And it's not as easy to put a high probability bet on anything, but that risk is exactly what people get rewarded for, theoretically. Uh, gold stocks, same story, GDX down 5%, GDX J down 7%, uh, both very close to oversold territories on the RSI. And uh, that's on the weekly chart, mind you. The monthly relative strength index, I got it on here as well. This is, it's still, it's relatively st it's strong, I guess, at around 40. It's not too far off from the lows, by the way, in 2015, where the same index hit the 30 to 35 range. So zooming out on these charts, by the way, can, can be very helpful uh, if you're not a short-term trader. Um, what else? Oh yeah, my favorite sentiment gig on here, the BPGDM though, that has been, uh, it's, it's been completely destroyed and it, it now rests on 17. And the RSI of that index is also very, very close to being oversold. And it's only gotten oversold once in recent history. And that was over here, I mean, during the exaggerated 2020 March crash. But so this index being at 17, it means that almost nobody's bullish on gold stocks right now. So if if all of this is is telling you anything, then that should be that the sentiment on gold and and silver stocks and the gold and silver stock the, the metals and the stocks is completely dead. But maybe it has a little more room to die. That makes no sense. I, I hope you're kind of getting what I'm trying to say here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I do. Do I know what I'm trying to say? Anyways, I didn't talk to anybody uh, about gold and silver stocks last week. Because if you, um, if you remember, I spoke to Lobo Tigre the week prior to this, to, to, to this video. And so basically he told me that, although I'm right and the sentiment is headed towards dumpster, it would not be wise to go all in on gold and silver stocks right now. Because although you might, you know, you might get lucky and hit the exact bottom before a relief rally and you might look like a genius for a minute there, the macroeconomic setting is very unstable and it can easily get much worse from here because 
we really haven't seen the biggest issues unravel yet. It's mostly hints of potential troubles that are uh, ruining the broad sentiment and, and selling off the markets, uh, every market really. But he did tell me that if he didn't have any position or if he was underexposed to precious metals, he would have been starting a position right now because the prices he said are very cheap. Because the, the risk of not having any is any position or too small of a position when the sentiment is that dead is rather large, he told me. Now, I, haven't, I don't have as much cash. as I'm about 10% in cash. Uh, I'm expecting a check to come in very soon, which would sort of double my cash position, but that, that remains to be seen. Uh, and if that happens, then I'll have to reevaluate where we might be in the market at that given time, and I might have to start buying. I'm hoping. Though. Not that anybody should care about that. As you know, I'm inexperienced and I'm recording this as my diary if you haven't gotten the vibe yet. But uh, uranium stocks sold off less aggressively last week, and the URNM is down just about 2.5% on an incredibly low volume, which might be suggesting that the sellers are um, getting exhausted and they cannot apply the same pressure on the price anymore. And the moves in the RSI are also becoming smaller and smaller, uh, although we still haven't hit oversold territory on that index on the URNM, on the weekly chart. And the good thing about times like this is that, uh, again, like Lobo told me last week, you want, to, you want to look at the companies that are currently cashed up. They don't have to tap this horrible market for cash anytime soon. As you know, that would, that would obviously result in too much dilution. And um, the companies that just have their, you know, their they have their heads down and they're doing the work, preferably they're even releasing some results into a weak market, which could mean that you're getting paid to take on more value, meaning the stock will sell off a couple of percent on good news simply because the market is weak, basically. And uh, this is the main thing, by the way, that attracted me so heavily to, to this sector is that you can have an almost worthless shell of a, an exploration company that only has some type of a thesis, let's say it's trading at a dollar. And then six months later, when that company has has proven its thesis and, and, and it's found what it was looking for, then the stock is is all of a sudden trading at 50 cents. So you pay less and you get more, uh, you know, as a cheapskate, that's what gets my blood going. And uh, there are multiple companies like that in, in Uranium right now. Uh, a few of them, by the way, are on Lobo's shopping list. And um, I believe two or three of the seven companies on his shopping list are uranium companies. And they're now trading very close to his buying uh, target price. So that was interesting to see. If you want to see those, by the way, I'm, I've become an affiliate of Lobo. So I basically help him sell subscriptions. I get a couple of bucks because I think they're worth the money many times over. So I'll leave a link to his track record somewhere in the description or, or whatever that you can see. It's an expensive service. But um, again, I think it's worth worth the money. And uh, you know, talking about such companies, one of my one of my personal holdings. So readers beware. I'm, I'm, I'm talking my book here. I'm biased as much as I can be. But one of my companies is um, is doing exactly that, and that's Baseload Energy. And they just had some news last week about um, finding more shallow mineralization. Yet their stock closed a week down almost four percent. So I had the chance of talking to their CEO about this news release last week, but uh, also a little bit more about their plans for the future in the general market, how they plan on raising money, stuff like that. So uh, here's James starting off with an explanation on wh what they found and what they're going to do with it in the Athabasca 2.0. We hit a lot of mineralization that was near surface, especially hole 65. We had 50 meters of continuous mineralization, 80 meters composite mineralization. So composite is just basically summing up all of the, the parts of mineralization and it looks great. It's, I'm very happy that this shallow mineralization continues. We also hit what looks to be a new zone in hole 63 further to the west. And that is also shallow mineralization. So, and that's the, the big trick of it all, really. That's what we set out to find with, with Baseload doing our Athabasca 2.0. I'll also make note that yesterday, our, uh, our peers to the north, 92 Energy, also came out with some very encouraging news, uh, some great results out of that. And it's getting closer to surface as well. So all of this combined is really looking like exactly as it should be that this is not the next discovery this is the next mine in the athabasca at least fingers are crossed okay right that's your whole thesis of uh, athabasca 2.0 that's what you went with um and, and i i hope we're going to touch upon most of the things that you mentioned in that 92 energy news release as well and uh, i also know that we we went over grades and stuff like that in our last conversation sort of master class on how to read these things but um, you might have to refresh that in here because you, you were talking about um, 1,000 plus like um, CPS accounts per second 
over 52.3 meters, that is. Um, but that's not yet translated in percentages because you're waiting for the assay results or something like that to be able to report that in percentages as opposed to counts per second. Um, per second. W but how does that, like, how, how am I supposed to look at that? What, what, does, that, what does that mean, the 1,000 counts per second? It means that there is radioactivity there. I, I can't give an exact number. The loosest term that I can do is, you know, it, it's going to be 0.1% or higher in theory. 0.1%, uh, yeah, 0.1% U308 or higher. That's one of the things that we're also trying to develop is by using the SINT data is being able to put together a rough U308 type of calculation. So an almost EU308 I. No, I, I don't like doing that on downhole gamma probe just because mm -hmm. it's not the core. The core and downhole gamma probe doesn't go into the lab. I like doing it right on the core. So as we as we start getting some more assays back and when we start releasing those, then hopefully we will be able to put that into better correlation. I, even as I even as I talk, there could be a potential that we we already have a calculation and it could be the CPS multiplied by two divided by 10,000. Mm. So 1,000 CPS could be equivalent to 0.2% U308. Mm. So it's just, yeah, it, it's the higher, the better. The high, yeah, uh, that's what I, I was trying to read up on it. And that's also what I found out. But is there is there sort of a, a risk or something that the grades come back from the assay lab and, it, and they're like, you know, this is, like it's not significant. Is there a way that you can have a lot of a lot of radiation, basically, but no significant grades? Yep, absolutely. And that's a nugget effect, which mm -hmm. happens in a lot of different commodities. So, for example, I think we actually had that one of our drill holes, hole three. It was either hole three or hole four. No, I'm pretty sure it's hole three, uh, where we had some really high CPS and like on the order of 2000 or something, when the assays came back, it was about 0 0.05, 0 0.06. And we're scratching our heads like, this really doesn't make sense. And you go back to the core and you look at it like, okay, well, there's our visible nugget of, of uraninite in there. And then the rest of the core is probably really disseminated. So it, it almost depends on, on the, the side of the core that you're taking. But this is where all of this really comes into play when you are trying to think about mining and, and developing it. So the more, the more continuous the mineralization, the more robust it is like that, that nugget effect that I just gave was a very isolated um, uh, interval. There was nothing really around. It was, uh, I think a two meter interval of, or, or even half meter interval of thousand CPS. But when you start getting these 50 meter zones and these 10 meter zones, those are more, those should have more continuous mineralization, but yeah, it's, it really depends like even vein systems. So if you've got your core coming down like this, you've got a vein that's skirting this side of the core. And let's say you sample this side of the core while well, you're not going to see the vein. So it, it takes a lot of, takes a lot of, um, I guess, forethought on the people doing the sampling and, and so forth to make sure that you sample things correctly. So in this example, again, you've got your vein here. What you'd want to do is turn your core like that and then split down like that. So half the vein goes into the lab, half of the vein stays in the box. Mm. But if it's, if it's disseminated mineralization, then sometimes you can hit, sometimes you can miss. And there's, I, I know gold stories about that. Uh, tin stories, same way. Uh, people, they built, they built, they had their resource done. They built their mines they start mining. They're like, what the heck? We're not getting the grades that we thought we were. And mm. lo and behold, it's just, it's, it's called nugget effect. Right, 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 right. And so you, you need to get the results back from the assay to have a higher certainty on what this really means, but this is sort of already giving you hints of, okay, something is going on in terms of we, we, you know, the, the potential for having uranium here is, is, is now much higher. Um, that makes sense. When do you think are the labs still backed up, or like when, when do you think you're going to get the results? Is it anytime soon? Oh, 60 to 100 days turnaround time, basically. That's three that's months. What plus. Yeah, wow. that's what we're seeing. Typically, uh, historically, it's been anywhere from four to eight weeks, but now we're seeing you know, twice that. Hmm. Hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Well, so we we can't talk too much about grades. What I did find out though is that um, that like when you when you get the counts per second, this is what you got of around a thousand. That's not considered high grade for the Athabasca Basin. It's not like you know um, what I read is that high grade would be considered like ten thousand counts per second. Yes. Um, yeah. and so basically, it's saying like this is not gonna this is probably not going to be an arrow. It's not going to be Cigar Lake in terms of grade. But what's also interesting to me is that this is not going to be an arrow in terms of geometry too. Or maybe I'm using the, the wrong word, but what I mean is that it, like this is not 500 meters deep. Um, it is practically at surface, right? And then I also exactly. believe that the ground conditions, that what, that's what you guys talked about in the, in the technical overview, is that the ground conditions that you have over there, are they're not the same either as arrow because you're, you're not under a bunch of sandstone and um, you're also not under a lake, which would make the working conditions less harsh, right? Am I, am I, am I getting it correctly? Absolutely correct. Yep, exactly. Okay. okay. Well, maybe you can tell me more about that. Like, why, why is that? What's up? Like, you, you don't have the sandstone, but I thought sandstone hosted deposits are actually beneficial or like, maybe you can talk to me more about that. No, the, the sandstone is important on the, the geological side for the formation of uranium. Mm. That, that's because historically what we've seen in the Athabasca have been called unconformity style of deposits. And the unconformity is literally that, that hair thin layer that demarks the, the sandstone and your crystalline basement rocks. So it's, it's just, it, it's literally a break in time. That's what uh, an unconformity is. And that's because of that difference in the rock types and you've got this porous sandstone and you've got these faults coming up uh, throughout the basement rocks that it creates a chemical trap, which is why the unconformity has always been the place preferentially for uranium exploration in the Athabasca, because that's, that's where you can find the biggest and the best deposits typically. But <clears throat> that, that sandstone we know was a lot larger. And it did cover the areas such as where Hook is or where Accio is right now. It did sandstone used to be there, so but it's been eroded. So we've let nature do its work for us mm. to get rid of the sandstone, and now we've got the basement rocks on top. So you don't you don't have those issues. And that's again that's the whole idea behind Athabasca 2.0. Let nature do its work for you, and get to an ease of mine mining scenario. Is that going to have, this might be a stupid question, but is that going to bring you any problems with uh, metallurgy? Like, I mean, your deposit is still uraninite hosted, right? There's nothing else there or? From what we've seen, we probably have two different styles of, of mineralization. And there's a few ways to think about it. So yeah, mineralogy is obviously a very important part. And that's one thing I learned in the rare earth industry. It doesn't matter about your, your grades or your size of the deposit. It really comes down to your metallurgy and your mineralogy. That's going to be the big trick of it all. Like we keep talking about, well, the Key Lake Mills right there. You know, we can send material to there, hopefully. Can we? And that's where studies have to come into play. We need to know if we have the right mineralogy that, they're, that they have, um, that, the, that they're basically optimized for that their processes can extract the uranium from what we've seen in, in the drill core. Like I said, we've got uh, basically looks like two different styles of mineralization. One looks to be like pitch blend. And we have that in our corporate presentation, which is just black nodules. And that's what you want to find. That is the easiest to process done. Great stuff. Uh, the other is more of a yellowish orange and it looks like gummite, which is a secondary form of, of, Pitch blend as well, or uraninite, sorry. Pitch blend's an old term that's been done and over with. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's what we have. And we are we are conducting a mineralogical study that should be done within the next two months that mm -hmm. is not going to look at liberation right now. That is one of the plans for next year. But we're looking at uh, doing mineralogy as well as trying to see the, the upgrade potential that does exist with the potential grades that we have. So can we upgrade by 10 X to be able to send into a mill? Okay. I think I'm kind of making sense of it. And also when you mentioned pitch blend, I, for a second, I forgot that actually pitch blend is just uraninite. That's what they used to call it, but it's just the yeah. same, same type of rock. That's what you want to be hosted. Okay. But then, so we're getting these results later on in the summer, potentially right after the summer. So that's a good thing to look out for. Does this have something to do, the fact that you don't have sandstone, does this have something to do with the 
loss of core that you've seen? Because I think you lost something like 20% of the core on one, one section. So what's that all about? That's just the rock conditions. Again, we're, the Athabasca is a faulted network. And so you've got a lot of clays in there. You've got a lot of different voids happening because as you fault rocks, you create voids, you create uh, brittle areas. And sometimes that is just simply not recoverable in the drill core. Hmm. And especially when you do get to where mineralization is typically hosted, it's you need the faults to have the fluids to come in there and mineralize, mineralize the system. We also call them hydrothermal networks. So that means that your rocks are being basically being altered to clay. And clay is is not as strong as let's say a granite. You know, so so as you're drilling down, drill, you know, the drilling is a mechanical process, but it also uses a lot of water. And so some of that water that's being used, it will flush away some of you know, some of the the clays and, and mineralogy that's down there. If it's it's if it's very loose and unconsolidated going through a fault zone. So those are just the, some of the things that we we're assuming is happening down there. Hmm. When you say you're assuming, and you're also talking about a, a, a you know a spot in the Athabasca that is not really being looked at too much in the past. So I'm just, um, I think I've asked you this before, but I'm still wondering, especially when you're hitting and hitting more, how come nobody else thought to do what you did before? How, how come nobody did it like in when when they found out about Cigar Lake or when they found Arrow? How how come nobody was doing what you're doing right now? Because everyone's been looking for the unconformity. Everyone's looking for MacArthur River. They're looking for Cigar Lake. They're looking for these massive style of deposits. And I don't think people, there's two sides really to, to exploration. And one side is trying to find a discovery. One side is trying to, to find a discovery that can go into production. And that's literally a big, a big thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, People have been looking for these unconformity deposits without thinking down the road. Like, how, how, what grades do you need? What size do you need to have the value in the rock to have a, a to have a, a capital, capital I, uh, capex and an opex to sustain a mineable environment that you can make a profit from, mm. and so. People go down, they, they look for the unconformity because, again, that's where that's what we've been calling these things for the longest times, unconformity hosted uranium deposits, not considering the point beyond the discovery. At least that's that's my interpretation. I can't speak for everybody out there, but that, that was something that I had come across back in 2010, even before the Arrow discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger Wallace and Bill Kerr, Bill Kerr, who was actually my, my boss back in the Denison days, they came out with a phenomenal paper that really addressed that. And it made a lot of sense. It's like, look at the past, look at what has been mined. It's, it's all of these open pits, all of these added style of deposits to get down to the, to get underground in the Athabasca, you need your monsters. The chance of discovering a monster, very slim. Mm -hmm. So it's not <clears throat> particularly money well spent from a risk reward standpoint, I don't know how much time you spend on Twitter. I hope you don't spend any time on Twitter, but uh, <laughs> there's a thing going account. on where, where people, I, I hate what people say people. Cause we, I'm, I'm a person too. Um, I try not Are to you? talk too much on Twitter. <laughs> I'm a ginger, robot, but I man. have a soul. Okay. But so, yeah, I try not to talk too much on Twitter, but I, I try more to read. And it looks like there's a lot of, um, a lot of people who prefer to be right rather than make money because you know i follow a lot of tra traders and investors and and uh this sounds like that type of thing where you like you want to be right in terms of you know you want to stick your name to like the biggest discovery of uranium ever but nobody's ever going to make money on it like it nobody's going to be able to mine it economically and you're saying we're just approaching it from the other side like this might not be you know jaw dropping dropping like 25 percent grades but if the thesis that you're approaching this with works, then you might have a, you know, a profitable mine at the right uranium price, of course. Um, exactly. Okay, but so you're currently not the only one doing this. So you've got 92 Energy right up onto your border. And uh, is there is it too early to speculate or talk about potential partnerships or something like? Are you guys even talking? 
We talk, but it, I, it's far too early to speculate on anything like that. They have got their drill program on the go. We've got our drill program on the go. And, you know, I, I think we'll see what happens down the road. Hmm. Okay. So, if, you, <clears throat> yeah. And my, 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 my view on all of this is that if we're both hitting it out of the park and we both have what looks like is going to be, it's, it's, it's the same deposit, to be very honest. You know, it's not like you've got two different deposits. It's the same system. So if this does get developed down the road, both of those sides will have to be combined into one. Mm -hmm. Who does it? So it's, does a major come along and take both companies out? Does one take, uh, do we, do we merge? And yeah, a lot of, a lot of different questions to be asked and what's going to be beneficial down the road. Mm. But it's just too early. Like it's not that. Yeah. And I guess you, not, you, you both are focusing on drilling, right? That's the important yeah. thing now. So both companies are not even 12 months from discovery. Mm. Okay, the, the 92E announced their discovery, I think it was early September. Uh, and then we announced ours late September. Mm. How crazy is that you guys are cheaper now than back then in terms of market cap? They're a war almost oh, the ridiculous. same. <laughs> Like, <laughs> right? Because you had a thesis. Yeah. Now you have um, a proof. Of, you don't have too much, but you have a proof of concept, which is already something, right? So, um, okay. Well, one of the concerns might also be that someone is paying attention right now and steps in and buys you right now at like 20% premium or something and, and shareholders don't get to write up. Is that, would you consider an offer if it comes in right now? No idea. We would have to, we would have to play it as it comes. Yeah. Yeah. That's all speculation at this point, I guess. Yep. I don't really know how these things go. So that's why these questions might be stupid, but uh, anyways, go, going forward, you're going to be, you're going to keep on drilling. I believe yep. there's another what, two, 3000 meters left. So that's what, 10 to 15 holes maybe during this program. No, yeah, roughly. Roughly. Yeah. Okay. So, but wait, oh, you always mentioned that you found another, um, near surface zone that you'd like to target what, what are the plans there what, what are the plans for these uh last couple of holes for this season we really like what's going on with the near surface mineralization the the shallowest stuff that we have because that's you know it, it's been the widest it's been the uh can't say the highest grade but we we've seen some of the the best mineralization in those zones so that's where we want to put our focus on because again if, if this does turn into a deposit a mine, sorry, if this turns into a mine, that's what's going to get mined first. There's, you know, there's no doubt about it. So that's where we really want to grow this thing and see the potential size of it all. So that's, we'll focus on the north, we'll focus on the south, we'll focus on the west. Uh, the east, we're, we're kind of closing that off as we continue some, drilling some of these, um, some of these pads. Uh, some of these fences we are we're getting an idea they're still open to a degree that we haven't fully closed off everything and demarked where the absolute edges are of for all of this but to to get the best bang for our buck and to grow this yeah we go north south and west north south and west are you guys still okay with the indigenous communities first nations that are around there to do all that yep absolutely okay yep. okay and so for when is this? Uh, when does this season end? By the way, what are you like? Is it in? Because you you're north, right? It's gonna start getting cold, I guess, in like end September or something along those lines. Yeah, I've seen lakes freeze up in northern Saskatchewan as early as late September, mm. but it's it's not really. It's not the freezing that's going to limit us. It's the daylight hours because mm. we're we're helicopter supported, and we're north of the no we're close to the 60th parallel so things do get pretty dark very quickly and that will be the, the limiting factor but we're also considering what the market is like because you just mentioned it earlier you know we're, we're putting out good results and our market cap is down so right. is there is there really do we benefit going forward continuing to put out some good results and continuing and spending money spending our hard dollars and seeing the market cap go down hmm. from business, from a business perspective, that doesn't make sense. Right. 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 Well, I, what I mean, it's, 
you sort of know that you know it's the market it's a deleveraging event as they call it that's happening yeah. right now that doesn't always make sense i guess that's where the the, the opportunity lies for speculators Possibly, there's a lot of unknowns, of course, as to where do we go? Do we go into a recession? What is the macroeconomic settings? And unfortunately, that that that's not just theory that you know real, translates into real life issues as to what you could be having if you, for example, like uh, you you want to do the southeast of your property. I'm guessing for the next season, obviously, and but you're gonna have to finance that. Right, and then if you have to finance it at, at even lower prices than right now, which I think you wouldn't be happy to be raising money right now, right? Correct. We're not doing our shareholders justice by doing that. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know what? Talking about raising money, let's let's maybe talk about that as well. There's uh, you know, I mentioned Twitter that there's comments on Twitter. Um, you know, people are talking, and it, um, one of the people talking a lot about that is the uranium corgi. Uh, but a great guy. So shout out to him. But he's um, he, he's basically a guy who used to he used to or st- like he still likes space load, but he found out that like you don't have uh, no no short cl- cl- clauses when you when you raise money on float through shares or something like that. I'm not 100 percent on w- w- what it exactly happens there, but it, he was basically asking if that's something that you'd consider doing in the future you know, adding a no short clause for a given period of time so that people don't just take the flow through shares and then turn around and short the same amount of shares because apparently that hurts us, you know, retail investors. So is that something that you you, you can comment on or have thought about? I've thought about for sure, because that did happen to us in December. We did right. a flow through financing. We got shorted for 13 million shares or whatever it was, it was, no, it would, did not paint a very pretty picture on us. So that is definitely something worth considering. Mm. Is that the way that I understand it is that a company is almost getting its arms twisted to do it, especially if it's a bad market, because people will basically give you that people who don't care about the company will come along and easily give you that money because they know that for them, that's a risk-free return for accredited, you know, large deep pocket the investors basically that's a risk free risk free return for them and it's almost as if they don't really care what company they're giving the money to because it's free money to them the way that i understand mm-hmm. it you know i might be oversimplifying this but is that is that is that the thing or like how does that go down in the real world no, that's you pretty well nailed it Over, <laughs> oversimplified but yeah that's basically what it is so it would it depend on the market. Like if we do the next leg up from here on, you, you could probably find enough money to finance your net, next drill program without having to do um, w- w- with having the no, no short clause in there, basically. Good question. <clears throat> uh, that's you know, with or without the short clause. Uh, we can do the financing, no problem. I, I feel that would be a no brainer. But uh, to protect ourselves and to protect our investors, I do think that it's, it is better to have that worked in. Would that stop any any institution or retail investors getting into it, into the placement? Then I honestly don't know. I think it but. might, but then I'm thinking if it stops them from getting in because they want to be involved in an activity that the first time I heard about it, I was like, this is like, it's illegal, right? And you, you can't do that, but it is very much legal. So, yeah. but if they want to get into just to do that type of gimmicks, do you really want them as shareholders? Exactly. No, nope. so. exactly. It's nailed it right on the head there. Mm-hmm. Well, so yeah. it could be, it could be a really good way to, to fish out who we do want as our investors moving forward. Right. And then, right. And maybe you could do you know, maybe it's a good thing that it happened to you rather early before you, before you started hitting. So, yeah. Well, I think I'm all out of questions on this. Is there something that, that you wanted to, to talk about in, in, in the news, something, something else that you thought was really interesting, but I'm failed to, to bring up? No, I think we've covered it all. It was pretty simplistic. Like mm-hmm. the, everything that we're seeing looks like it has the potential to really go into mining operation. That's based on the historic results or historic mining operations in Saskatchewan. Mm-hmm. I, I know there were different circumstances. Like you look at Uranium City, they had contracts with the, I think it was the Ontario government. That's why they basically mined all those out and they 
you know, everything was written in stone, but that's kind of the way the uranium market goes anyway, is you don't just put up a mine and say, Oh, here, no, you come buy this from me. No, no, no. You have, you have the contracts in place already before you start your mine. Hmm. Otherwise it, it's not like, I don't, I don't really know how gold works. I've always thought is yes, gold. You come out, you just mine it and you've got, you've got money, you know, you've got financial currency right there and anybody will take it off your hands. Uranium is not like that. You need to have your contract in place. You need to know that it's going to go somewhere. So unless you have those, then nothing goes forward, I guess. So it's a yeah tricky situation, but we're happy where we are. We're, we're very happy with everything that we're seeing. Like I said, it looks like it has all the potential for being uh, open pit style of mineralization based on the size between Accio and 92E's GMZ. Uh, grades are looking like they are supportive of of these type of operations and the infrastructure we're hoping is right next door that it can be used and it's a, has the potential for being a great money maker i think okay okay is it too early to talk about um sort of timeline like is, is that something that is going to take 20 years to 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 get into production or is that something that could would potentially hope be pro- yeah I, I would really hope not because, uh, again, historically, these open pit deposits have gone from discovery into production within a six to 12 year time frame, which is very short. Look at Cigar. Cigar took about 40 years to go from discovery to production. That's insanity. So theoretically, you know, shallower mineralization takes less meters to drill. So you, you can get more drill holes done. You can do your definition drilling with much less meters. And so that's a shorter time frame as well. We're in Saskatchewan, which already has, you know, they know uranium mining in Saskatchewan. They know open pit mining. The mills are established. So a lot of the, the permitting side of things or the even this the, the whole uh, federal policies and provincial policies are already in place. You know, there's really nowhere else in Canada that can say that same thing. They would have to develop their policies and that's, that's time. That takes a lot of time, especially in Canada. Things don't just move on the click of a button. There's a lot of back and forths and putting things into place, but Saskatchewan has this already developed. Hopefully it's not too problematic because the last, really some of the last mines that went into production were the, the Sioux pits in early 2000s. And I'm hoping and those are all open pits, by the way, but I'm hoping nothing has really changed fundamentally in the last 15 years to 20 years. But permitting wise should hopefully be quick. Environmental side of things, you know, that's something that has to be addressed. And then the, the First Nations as well. So as we continue to move this forward, it's you know, we're, we're trying to be forward looking and trying to see at least two to three years, five years even ahead of us of what is going to be required. You know, having, having, a, having a feasibility study nowadays doesn't make sense because the market is changing so bloody quickly. It's, you, know, you, you, can, you can have all your costs laid out and in six months, they can be completely scrapped and rewritten. And so that, that's one of, the, one of the tricky issues to deal with as well. Right, 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 right. Yeah, why, why I'm asking you, it- my question comes from sort of a greedy place because the, the best performer during the last cycle that I know of was um, Paladin, I guess. We do. And they went from discovery all the way into production or right up to production. And they did like, a, a, um, you know, they went from a penny to like 10 bucks a share. And that's why I'm asking. I'm sort of speculating on, on that. I've, uh, I've had this mission to try and find the, the next Paladin. You can't move as fast as they can. That's, it's just, it's the reality of the situation. Their big discovery, Langer Heinrich, Africa. Okay. That's, uh, it's a different jurisdiction. Africa is similar to Saskatchewan in a way. And, and they were, yeah, they were able to just um, expedite things very quickly there and they've done well, but yeah, well, we'll, we'll see. My, my hope though is to really get into this cycle and that's what I'm going to push for. Because oh, that's wow. that's what we need. Wow! But is that the world needs what? uranium, man? That's this is why I'm doing this. I'm I'm a nuclear bull. I'm I'm 110 percent behind nuclear energy, and I want to provide the fuel to to help the power civilization. Yeah, absolutely. And then Brandon Monroe out of um, Bannerman also told me that 
um, he'd speak to a couple of um, a couple of executives of of um, developers and explorers in the mining in, in in the uranium industry, and he said like when I'm talking to them, it feels like the majority of them doesn't realize what industry they're in, and and he says that um, he says we're not in the mining industry, we're in in the energy industry first, and then we're in the mining industry, and so that that made a lot of sense to me, but uh, yeah, a lot. And it comes down to contracts. Mm. It all comes back down to the contracts. You know, you're not mining if you don't have a contract. If 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 you don't see the path forward for where your product is going to go, you're not mining. Right. Right. Because it's it's profitability. Again, it comes down to it, it doesn't come down to being being right. It com- comes down to to making make making money. That's what you know, that's what it that's why it's a business. So, but you guys are explorers, right? I mean, your team is, right is now, made yeah. for yeah. exploration. Yeah. So, is that like is that something that you're willing to see through, like become you know become a producer ever? I have no issues with that at all. I think it would be a great. I think it'd be a fun time to to really ramp up. I'm dedicated to seeing that through myself. Mm. So I'm I'm willing to jump through as many hurdles as possible. <laughs> That'd be a massive thing for your career as well. I'm thinking, so going from yeah. an explorer to a producer, but you like that's something that you're actually motivated at. You know, that's something that you would want to do yourself. Like you don't want to necessarily just start looking for other CEOs or something. You just take a seat at the board, or who knows? On, and I'll honestly cross that when we get there. But the way I see it right now, like from from my own standpoint, is exactly that. I'd I'd like to take this all the way. Mm-hmm. Okay. This, yeah. The, the, yeah. The experience is invaluable, and just learning every step of the road along this path is, yeah. That that you, you can't get that in a textbook. You can't get that in a school setting. You got to get it real life. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we we've thrown out so many forward looking statements here, and it's and a lot of speculations. So, uh, yeah. Thank you for sitting down with me and explaining everything. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Antonio. Moving on, a couple of other um, interesting happenings in uranium and on uh, on uranium Twitter this week. First of all, let me start off with the most recent news. This is from Saturday, thanks to Uranium uh, Iron Man for sharing this on Twitter. But Uzbekistan has declared a month-long state of emergency in a region that has been hit hard by protests, basically. Now, Uzbekistan is an ex-Soviet republic. It's not a large country country. It's about the size of the um, state of California. And its GDP per capita last year was just about $2,500. Okay. Whereas California, that same GDP was at about 85,000 last year. So not a very rich nor a large country. But what is important here is that according to the World Nuclear Association, Uzbekistan was the world's fifth largest uranium supplier uh, that produced over 7% of the world's uranium supply. That's last year. And it's currently also growing that uranium supply. The French Orano has a uh, joint venture there. And some Asian countries, among which Korea, Japan, and China, they were also investing in the, in the country's uranium deposits. But as far as I'm getting it, the region that has been blocked off and, and kicked off the internet, uh, essentially, is up in the northwest part of the country. And uh, most of the uranium mining happens uh, over here in the middle. So what's happened doesn't seem like a direct issue for, for the uranium supply, but it does show how fragile these regions are. And, and, and those regions that are those are regions that produce quite a lot of uranium, uranium that we cannot afford not to get. And this is yet another reason why I like this thesis so much. Because again, we're we're dealing with an undeniable and an undeniably growing demand for uranium in a very fragile supply system, while the price of uranium is still sitting under the incentive price for production. So actually, I, c- I could probably just shut up about uranium right now and don't say a word on it from now until like the $70, $80 range, because this is really all that matters. But I got to eat, I got to shower at least a few times a month, so my wife t- tells me, so I got to keep making these videos, man. But um. Talking about the price of uranium, by the way, what, when I say that, what I'm referencing to is the spot price. But if Mike Alkin is correct, which I assume he is because he, he knows uranium better than me, obviously. But so if he's correct, then the spot price doesn't matter at all because the spot market is almost irrelevant. What does matter is the price at which contracts are being signed. And if you watch the video that I did last week on Sunday, maybe it was two weeks ago. I don't really remember, but I spoke about the, the, the Chinese utility company 
signing a uranium delivery contract at over $61 a pound for 40% of that contract. So um, yeah, what else happened last week, by the way, is that Encore Energy just signed a contract that apparently was in the works from the beginning of this year. So that's important. It's basically US utility signed a uranium delivery agreement with them for 600,000 pounds of U308. It's not a huge contract, uh, but it did speak to their CEO last week. The video is still up on my channel, and I thought that was a very interesting conversation, by the way, not only about their news, even if you don't care about the company, but like if you better want to understand how the contracting cycle works from a, from a veteran that sold uranium in, in prior cycles, I suggest you watch that video. But so we're basically seeing an increased activity in the uranium contracting space across the world. And, and Paul also told me that there's, he's no longer the one who has to track down and call the utilities to try and sell them uranium. It's the utilities that are now calling him. So I, I thought that was an important piece of information. Um, but yeah, further on in, in relation to uranium supply and demand, to the fundamentals, what else has happened last week is that the U.S. government announced an, an RFP, that'd be a request for proposal. And it, it basically means that the government is now officially in the market for uranium. They're looking to buy, uh, they're looking to buy uh, an initial 1 million pounds. And it has to come from uranium that's produced within the borders of the U.S., it also has to be a company that has produced uranium before, so between now and 2009. So no new producers. That's an important one. The company doesn't have to be in production right now, though. The, you know, the, the government just wants someone who's proven to be able to produce, I guess. And it has to be a company that has uranium inventory at the Honeywell Conversion Facility that's in Illinois. Essentially, the, the U.S. government wants to buy risk-free uranium. And they are also diversifying it, by the way. So they anticipate uh, buying that from up to four vendors. And they're in a rush too, because if you see this on here, they want to have all proposals essentially this month before August 1. That's at least what I'm getting out of it. So that's obviously another bullish sign for uranium and, and even more so a proof of concept because it's it's simply saying that the US government is just starting to get worried about it, about the domestic uranium supply. You know, they're thinking about it. And the fact that they're using this RFP suggests that they're not confident on the free market figuring itself out. And I guess they're not confident that there will be enough uranium production at their will and at their desired prices when they need it later down the road. So they want to ensure having it right now. So again, very bullish sign um, for the price of uranium. If I'm understanding this correctly, please correct me if I'm not. And my friend Chapman, by the way, he even told me that if there was no bull case for uranium before, now there definitely is one, and it's a rather strong one. With this on top of the, you know, the overfeeding, the effective ban on Russian uranium coming from Canada, uh, we have the immediate Japanese restarts. The demand for uranium is basically increasing beyond the point that anyone thought was possible back in 2018. And uh, we are now at around 200 million pounds in annual demand, and we would be at around 100 or so million pounds of annual supply when you would remove the underfeeding and then stuff like that. Yet the thesis, it already looked bullish to experts like Mike Hawkin and many others, even before that, even in 2016, right? So yet again, we're in a scenario where the fundamentals are getting better, yet the prices of the vehicles are falling. And uh, Art Hyde, by the way, from Segra Capital, seems to be noticing all that because they issued um, a newsletter, I guess, or an announcement or whatever this is in which he basically showed that Segra's year-to-date performance is um, it's pretty much flat. Well, technically positive at 1%, uh, but that's versus the uranium miners ETF and the S&P, which are, you know, they're down double digits. So uh, that's good. But what's more important in here is that he, he said that the current volatility in the markets is providing them with the, they call it the best investment opportunity in years. And that the last time they were that confident was in, that was March 2020, which resulted in, as you see on here, uh, a doubling of the portfolio in 2020, and then another 100 or so percent performance the year after that in 2021. So essentially, this newsletter is letting us know that yet another fund is, is going to start buying or is starting to, it's, they're aiming to be greedy when others are fearful. And they're even opening their fund to outside capital for the first time in a very long time. So overall summary, not bearish. But again, why would you trust me? Don't, please. I have no idea what I'm talking about. And if you decide to go off this information, make investment decisions on it, you will lose money because I'm terrible at gathering information. I'm great at oversimplifying and, and missing a lot of things. So it'd be safer if, for you to double check my information on here. Do not make investment decisions based on this. I'm serious. Uh, moving on, James just mentioned something about the negative effect. If you, if you, if you listen closely, 
And I think the negative effect is, is an important phenomenon that it, it needs to be understood by all natural resource investors, not only uranium investors, by the way. This, this, this happen, it happens a lot with gold, but it also happens in like tin, in copper, in uranium, obviously. Whatever, it happens in many different natural resources. And if you don't understand this properly, companies could take advantage of your, of your lack of knowledge and they might try and sell you onto a deposit with grades of up to like, I don't know, five kilograms of gold per ton or whatever. And, and they could end up you know, diluting you with the promise of, of building a profitable mine to just turn around months later and find out that the grades that they were hitting were not representative of, of like the whole deposit due to that nugget effect. So anyways, here's Dr. Henny explaining that negative effect, what the negative effect is and how to properly look at nuggety natural resource deposits. Okay, the negative effect is, is really a, a, a issue tied around sampling. Okay, it's uh, an issue where you have, we'll call it, well, inhomogeneous distribution of, of material in a rock. Okay, uh, in the case of mining, it's usually related to gold. It doesn't have to be gold. I mean, there's a nugget effect in basically any, any type of sampling that one might undertake. But the, the issue is this. Uh, in gold, in particular, you get uh, coarse particles oftentimes in, in the rock you're trying to sample. And how do you represent that? Okay. Um, let me first start by saying, explaining what is sampling and then how do we analyze a rock? Okay. Cause you have to understand that before you can understand how the nugget effect uh, affects the, the whole, you know, result, the end result. But usually when we take a sample of rock uh, it's, it's of a size of a few kilograms. Okay. So if it's a, a surface rock tip sample, a you know, spot sample, a channel sample, you know, really any type of sample, you're, you're shooting for a few kilograms of sample. You put it in the bag and then you send that to the lab. Okay, what does the lab do with it? They crush that material down. Uh, they crush it usually down to about two millimeters in size, you know, which is uh, you know kind of a coarse sand, we'll call it. And then they take a split of that. They actually split the sample uh, down. You know, you might start with ten kilos, but at the end of it, they might take a split of two hundred grams. Okay, so one fiftieth of what you started with. And in that that split, they they have uh, they then pulverize a sample. And what that means is they powder it down, like just take it down to absolute fine, fine powder. And then they, they, to analyze it, they might take a scoop of about 30 grams and do what's called a fire assay or, you know, some kind of assay on this. Okay. So you start out with say 10 kilograms of material. And by the end of the day, you're down to 30 grams. Okay. And this, this can apply to, you know, the samples I talk about, surface samples, but it can also apply to any drilling you, you do too, like core sampling stuff, whatever, whatever media you're, you're trying to analyze. You know, you're taking a big amount of material and you're reducing it down to a very small amount of material that you end up analyzing. Okay, now let's think about coarse gold. You throw coarse gold into this uh, equation and it can cause problems. Okay, now some deposits, no problem. Gold is very, very fine grain and fairly, you know, uh, not necessarily perfectly equally distributed through a rock, but it, it's at least, you know, uh, through the rock in a relatively homogenous way so that there's not much impact when you get your end results out of that fire assay. It's uh, it's fairly representative of the rock, but there's other cases where because you have coarse particulate gold, uh, by the time you get down to that 30 grams, you know, did your gold make it into that sample? In other words, does that 30 gram fire assay represent the actual gold content of the rock? Well, imagine if you have a sandbox. Okay, let's say you had a sandbox in front of you. And it's got one ton of sand in it, okay, 1,000 kilograms of sand. And let's say you, you, you want to, you, you have a, a handful of nuggets. You have a handful of gold nuggets. Now, one of the nuggets, we'll call it is big, let's call it a gram, okay? And then the other nuggets are somewhat smaller, okay, maybe down to maybe a few hundredths of a gram or something like this. And let's say you throw it in that sandbox, okay? So you you throw all those gold nuggets in there and you kind of give it a good stir and, you know, mix it all up. Now you're going to come along and you want to, you want to estimate how much gold is in that sandbox. You, you, you got a little bucket. Okay. And you're going to say, okay, I'm going to measure how much gold there is in each bucket. So you take a bucket of sand out and, and you, you put it in your gold pan, pan it down. 
Okay, you're going to do a lot of panning. Okay, first of all, a ton, you know, each gold pan might hold a few kilograms of, of material. So you're going to have to pan like 200 pans. So, you know, but but you can imagine what's going to happen. You're going to get nothing, 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 nothing. Oop, little piece of gold. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, there's a bigger piece of gold. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, boom, there's the big nugget. Okay, so what's representative of that sandbox? Well, um, you can't say there's nothing in it because sometimes you see a grain of gold. You can't say that there's a lot of gold because you got a very high value in one of those, you know, samples or one of those pans. You, so what's the real value? Well, the, the key is you, you have to now adjust the way you analyze things and, and try to take in more sample. Okay. So to, to overcome the nugget effect, which is basically uh, you know, just what I explained. It's it's an unequal e distribution of gold uh, because of you know the particle size and distribution of the rock uh, in in your final uh, analyses. The way you account for that is to take a bigger and bigger and bigger sample that you analyze at the end. Okay, now we are at a wonderful juncture in the exploration uh, world right now because we have relied on techniques like fire assay and stuff for hundreds of years. Okay. If you look back, uh, fire assay has been the go-to means of analyzing gold for a long, long time, but things are changing. Okay. Uh, here recently, you can start to see new techniques developed. Uh, about 15 years ago or so, there was a technique called leach well. And what leach well is, is uh, a cyanide leachable analysis. And you can perform it on a a large volume of material. Okay, you can you can do a leach well on a kilogram of material, or or even ten kilograms of material. Okay, so there you know it's a wet chemical technique where you put the the crushed material into a container, put in a solution, tumble it around, and the the gold actually gets dissolved into the solution. You get you analyze the solution, you can calculate how much gold was in the sample. All right, so so this leach well uh, really opened up people's eyes. Uh, I was one of the first companies or Nova was one of the first companies to use us at Beaton's Creek because we recognized we had a serious nugget effect. But then uh, new techniques developed. In the past five years, a new commercial technique has popped up called Chrysos, Chrysos Photon Assay. And in this technique, believe it or not, they can take crushed material down to two millimeters. So basically you don't have to pulverize it. You just crush your sample down to two millimeters and you take containers, you put a uh, little little containers that each hold about a half a kilo of material. You put this material into there and put it into the machine. It is bombarded with high energy uh, radiation. So high energy electromagnetic radiation is essentially high, high energy x-rays. And, and it, it emits uh, radiation back out. And the specter that comes back out of the container can be measured. And the quantity of gold in that container can actually be determined. Okay, this is amazing stuff. Because now you can actually take your, if you know you have a, a serious nugget effect where, you know, the gold is irregularly distributed in, in your sample, you can take the entire sample, crush it down. Let's say you have 10 kilos. You can crush the whole thing down. And then you put, you know, that entire sample into multiple pots, 20 pots, a half a kilo each. You can analyze the whole lot. You can analyze every single container. And then what do you get back? You get a whole, whole bunch of numbers that you can do a weighted average on, and you can actually determine very, very precisely now uh, how much gold was in your, your sample. And it, it has gone a long way to overcome some of the issues around nugget effect. Not all of the issues, but some of the issues. Okay, so uh, we've made great advances here recently uh, to overcome the nugget effect, at least in our analytic protocol. Uh, now, that said, you know, the nugget effect <laughs> is also, uh, how should we say it? It's, it's a bit of luck of the draw. Okay, when you're dr drilling a diamond drill hole through a vein and you know the gold is maybe coarse and irregularly distributed in that vein, you're going to get what you get. Okay, you, can't, you cannot predict where that hole is going to go through the rock and, and what it's going to intersect. Okay, so you basically, you know, that's, that's our biggest challenge here is that you have to take what you can get out of out of your drill hole how do we overcome that how do we maximize or minimize the nugget effect but maximize uh the amount of sample we get you use a bigger hole okay so you're seeing some companies move 
uh, for example, to PQ drill. And PQ is three and five eighths inch. So it's about yay big around, okay? And that uh, gives you a heck of a lot more core than, uh, you know, HQ core or something like this, okay? Which is, you know, quite narrow. It's like one and five eighths inch. So, so um, you can, or, sorry, NQ, you can get um, a bigger, bigger sample by drilling bigger holes. That's one way to help. So if you're in a nuggety situation, the bigger the hole, the better. Uh, with reverse circulation drilling, you might, you know, typical reverse circulation is about five and one quarter inch diameter holes. And you, but they have bigger bits. You can go to six and a quarter inch, or you can even go bigger than that. Okay. There's some bits that are up to a meter in diameter. Okay. So these are ways you can overcome the actual natural variability of, you know, distribution of gold in the sample. So it's a it's nugget effect is a is a headbang. I've done I've been involved with nuggety mineralization most of my career now, but there are ways that uh, that we in the geologic world can overcome and you know the nugget effect and truly estimate uh, the gold content of rocks. The other means is bulk sampling, bulk sampling and actually physically recovering the gold out of it. So. Long, long diatribe, but uh, hopefully that gives you a, a pretty good back, background. No, it definitely does. It definitely, you answered a lot of the sort of follow-up questions that I would have before even me ask him, so that's good. But it does sound expensive. Like everything that you, you told me sounds more expensive than if you're doing like veins or whatever. Is, is it? it? It is more expensive. And that's one of the biggest challenges with nugget mineralization is there are some companies that won't even venture in that direction. You know, a lot of major mining companies will not touch nuggety deposits unless, unless there's some ability to, you know, uh, routinely uh, account for it. Like, like, let me give you an example. Pretium uh, at Bruce Tech, once they got in there and they started mining, you know, big blocks, you know, stopes basically of material and get, got comfort around it. Yeah, that that was proof in the pudding, right? They they produced uh, gold out of the the very nugget mineralization, but you know, Pretium had to push a lot of hard yards for a long, long time. Okay, uh, I think when was Bruce Jack drilled? I think 2010 through 2012, somewhere in there, and then they developed it into a mine by 2015 or 16, I think it was, and they started producing gold. But every step of the way, every step of the way, everybody had mm, doubts, you know, is this really going to work? Is it going to, and it took, took years. It took years of, of demonstrating uh, you could produce gold out of that rock mm. before Newcrest, um, you know, took the plunge and actually acquired Pertium. So mm. most companies don't like it, uh, but there are, look, uh, you know, to be frank, Antonio, um, there are a limited number of gold deposits on the earth. And we have probably exploited by just because of the simplicity of them, we've probably exploited most of the finer grain gold deposits first. Okay. And we've left a lot of these kind of problematic nuggety deposits uh, still sitting there. Okay. So there's a heap of them around. I can list a dozen right off the top of my head of nuggety gold deposits that are probably very big, substantial deposits that could be producing a lot of gold, but haven't necessarily been advanced because of the challenges of the negative effect. Well, don't you think that companies are maybe right to sort of avoid them in terms of the probability of success? Like what, what is the, what is it sort of the success rate? Did you, maybe you don't have a fixed figure on that, but do most companies that come across a negative gold project, do they fail or, or do most of them succeed? Well, um, most of them, uh, I will call works in progress. Okay, I'll give you an example. There's a deposit in Nevada called Spring Valley, and it was it was first. It, look, it's been known for a long time. There was there was gold found there back in the early 1900s. In fa fact, I think Herbert Hoover operated a an alluvial gold mine uh, on the in the sediment that was washing out of this valley way back in the you know early part of the 1900s. Um, but it was around the mid 2000s, I think, that a company called Midway Gold jumped in there and they said, you know what, we're going to drill this thing and see if we can't make some sense out of it. Proved to be very, very nuggety. Okay. But, uh, but the company drilled up uh, and, and put together, I believe, in an inferred level, a pretty sizable resource. If I remember right, it's several million ounces, I, you know, I think five million or eight million ounces. It's a big deposit, very big deposit. The, the, company or that project ended up in the hands of Barrick. Uh, Barrick tried to advance it for a few years. Uh, 
Barrick, this was in the, the downturn of the gold space in the 2000 teens. And uh, I believe Barrick at some point decided to sell the op asset because uh, they needed cash to pay off, pay down their debt or something like this. But then the next owner took, took charge of it and now is advancing. And I don't know where it's at right now. I think it's in private hands. But a lot of these nuggety deposits, um, they take time and patience. So what you see is they, they tend to kind of advance slowly in the background, uh, while other projects, maybe more conventional projects, tend to be you know, developed in a more linear fashion. Mm -hmm. So it would probably also be, you should probably also be looking at, at the team that's doing, I mean, you should obviously always look at the team that's doing this, but maybe you want a team that's like more transparent and sort of updating you every step of the way, doing box, uh, bulk sampling, capping the rate. So they're not announcing like five kilograms of gold per ton or whatever. And, and, and stuff like that. So maybe you can talk to me about some of the red flags or yeah. something for companies oh, reporting you, on this. You know, we, we at Nova had, uh, uh, we, we advanced nuggety deposits pretty much for the ten, past 10 or 12 years. And it, it is very challenging. It's also very challenging to, to keep people informed in a meaningful way. Cause a lot of the times you're only dealing with part of your data set. You're trying to collect more data to get to your final answer, but it takes time. Uh, time. I can remember in uh, you know 2018 doing bulk sampling. We got some of the best experts in the world uh, to do to estimate the size of samples that we needed, the tonnage of samples we needed uh, at Caratha. And at the time, uh, given what we we knew about the preliminary sampling we had done, we knew we needed say five to ten ton samples. And we targeted those and we, we processed them. It took a long time. It was very painful to, to process those things, collect the gold. And what, you know, what people don't understand is you got to also analyze all the waste material to find out how much gold you didn't recover. Okay. But it took a lot of effort and a lot of time and money to get, get the answer. Now we did get uh, answers for those bulk samples. We, we got, I think, a few dozen bulk samples uh, processed during that time period, and we got very good data. Now, the, the catch was, at the end of the day, um, th turns out those samples were too small to estimate a resource in a meaningful way. Like, they're just, at the end of the day, once we collected the gold and we could see the size of the gold particles and stuff, uh, it was determined that we probably needed more like a few hundred tons or even maybe up to 2,000 tons of bulk sample to, uh, to generate data that would be resourceable. Uh, it is it is very difficult to advance these things. It's not to say there's not a heck of a lot of gold there. Um, there is, but uh, you know, then we we resorted to looking at sorting, and sorting has worked. We've demonstrated it's worked, but it's going to take a little while to get. Uh, we we have other priorities in the company right now, obviously, but uh, it's going to take a little while to get uh, get that sorting test work done, the field test work done. Mm -hmm. So what am I looking at if I open up a um, news release and it has to do, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it has to do with, with uh, place or placer or paleoplacer gold deposits, right? That's when the negative effect would happen. What am I looking for? So I need to see bulk sampling, probably the drill holes need to be closer to each other. We need to have longer, like you get, you more drilling. You got to see that the, the data that's been collected has been done in a meaningful way, like very deliberately. You know, in our case at Novo, we've con co we've determined what size of sample we need to collect. So like when we're drilling, uh, even like Beaton's Creek, for example, we know how many kilograms of material we need per half a meter interval out of the drill hole to get a good answer. Okay, so uh, we put a lot of work into determining that number. And we've, you know, been processing things at Chrysos, like I talked about earlier, and we get the best number possible. Okay. So I would say we're like way ahead of, of the curve as far as getting good data. But uh, yes, your, your answer is correct. All of those aspects, sample size, uh, the closeness of the samples, uh, you know, what is the gold distribution? Like how, how coarse are we talking about? There's, there's coarse and then there's coarse, you know, like uh, that has a big in, in, impact on on things. So all of these questions uh, have to be addressed. And in a nuggety environment, if a company's doing the right thing, they'll they'll tell you exactly what the process they're they're using uh, is. And we've we've done that. At Novo, we've we've kept people informed about the sample size and the actual techniques we're using. 
Mm-hmm. But it's still a process. It is a process. So what's the sort of the risk reward on this? Because if I'm I'm getting the risk pretty clearly, like a lot of things can go wrong. You can overestimate that. Like you can end up building, you can end up building the mine, spending the capex and whatever, and then you start drilling, and you're like, okay, we're not getting out of the ground what we need to be getting just because it's not you know it's not there the way it is a risk it is a risk you know you do the you get the best answer you can and then you know what you find at the end of the day is often there's other factors that come into play Uh, you know uh it boils down to a few things like there are very few uh surficial gold deposits left around the planet you know it's becoming increasingly hard to find uh surficial deposits at least you know in most countries there's a few Frontier countries that I'll, I'll say are still have uh, potential for finding near surface deposits, but we're at a point now where, you know, if you look across Western Australia, your odds of finding a near surface deposit of of significance is near zero. I mean, <laughs> to be frank, you know, so we're we're at a point where this is much of what is left uh, at Novo. Um, the, the thought was that the systems based on the geology of these things being very extensive uh, should justify the, the effort to go look for these things. And I think they still do. A lot of people ask me, have you given up on the, the model? No, I haven't. Uh, there's a lot of gold in conglomerates across the Pilbara. We've found, you know, we we've have the gold at Beaton's Creek, but we've also found gold at Caratha. We found gold at, at Edgina and many d- other different areas. There's an absolutely crazy amount of gold in these conglomerates across the region. It is very challenging. Um, we are doing our best to to make these things work, but it is not has not been without challenge. I can't you know can't deny that. But uh, boy, uh, you want to talk about a big price? This is the kind of price you want to go after. You know what do I? What's my best answer? Well, you know if if people want to invest going forward, I would say. Um, you know, you got you got a few choices here. You can invest in companies that are exploring for brand new blind dis- deposits, you know, buried systems, or you can invest in companies that are trying to tackle things like like Beaton's Creek or like Novo has in the Pilbara. So it it you know it's where we're at. It's where we're at in human history. You know, it it's not just gold. Um, there are many deposits out there that that are nuggety. In other words, uh, the material isn't necessarily distributed equally through the rock, and I think uh, I think you know stepping outside of the gold realm, I think it's going to become increasingly important that we understand and develop more technologies to tackle these problems. Um, mechanical sorting is a great example. We need to see mechanical sorting advance more quickly and and be applicable to more different types of deposits, because it's techniques like that that are really going to unlock. Uh, the future resources on the planet. Okay, there's only so much that Mother Nature has given us on this earth, and we've got to make the most of it. Okay, so um, I, you know, as painful as as advancing technical issues can be at times, if we don't do it, we as society aren't going to have the things we need. Okay, so it's it's actually very critical that we see uh, effort go towards tackling nuggety deposits. All right. If you're watching this on Independence Day in the U.S., I guess, have a great time with your family. Or I don't even know what I'm supposed to see here. Happy July 4th. Do you guys see that? Do you guys see? I don't know. Whatever it is, have a great time researching stocks or whatever whatever gets your blood flowing. Um, I don't know. And when you're back from your long week, and by the way, there's not going to be as much going on um, as it was last week. The beginning of the week will be rather calm on the economic economic news front. On Thursday, we get the jobless claims. We get non-farm payrolls on Friday, as well as unemployment rate on Friday. And so the predictions are that we'll see no increase in unemployment, but three out of the four, uh, three out of the five actually, last times uh, have been a miss, basically. So we've seen more unemployment than forecasted. And so if you combine that with the, you know, with the bad GDP growth numbers that, that came in last week, if there's a miss on unemployment next week, they'll probably be taken as bearish by the market and we might uh, get a sell-off towards the end of that week, but in the beginning, not much. So it will probably be worth watching, but I don't, I don't think it's going to matter too much to me uh, long-term, unless, as I said at the beginning, if the news gives another like brutal red week that would bring almost everything on my shopping list to oversold and I might start deploying capital, which could be good. But both ways, I'm, I'm still confident in my, on my on my 
portfolio long term, right? So uh, time for me to get off your screen, I guess, and for you to go fact check everything that I said, because uh, for all you know, I'm drunk, stupid and crazy. Right. All right. I, um, I wish you a great week and uh, I'll, I'll see you around next week. If you want to get this for, for free on Sunday instead of watch it on Monday on YouTube, I don't know why it's not really time sensitive, but if you want to do that, there's a, an option to subscribe to this email list on my website. It's uh, again, it's free and uh, yeah, I right, see you around.